No, stop. Cut it right now. We get right into it. Wait, Thor, what? Thor mega episode. Hit us with the legal Spiegel. Uh, okay, okay. This this is new. Um, the purpose of this podcast is to explore digital and print media. All respective sources we reference are owned by their respective companies, and our thoughts and opinions are strictly our own and do not reflect any biases or corporate agendas. Your discretion is advised. So yes, this I'm Demetrius, and I'm Demetrius, and Meech and Meech presents the Blurred City Podcast. So this is our Thor Love and Thunder mega episode. I've been Ooh. hyped about this for weeks ever since we started the pod sheesh and i'm i mean i'm super excited too i was like oh snap we decided to come in very hot i mean we get into it speaking of which now that we can talk about dwarf stars what else is hot oh that's a good one that's a good one so uh, of course thor hot as always you know uh boys ended so we're gonna but you're gonna get into more of that in our review of that show and then also there's this uh, animation that's been released on YouTube. It is called Legends, a Dragon Ball Tale. It is a fan animation that is uh, created by the fans and it is about, you know, just pretty much a love letter to Dragon Ball and fantastic animation, fantastic fight choreography, fantastic music. You need to go see it now. And well, after listening to this podcast, of course. <laughs> But yes, is Legend a Dragon Ball Tale by Agent Mystery Meat. That sounds so weird. But okay, yeah. For me, um, I watched The Black Phone last week. That's that was a good <laughs> horror movie. I, I like how horror is on Bloomhouse rarely misses. Uh, of course, Thor Love and Thunder, that's what we're here for. And then if you have if you're a parent and you have teenagers, just pray because Minions has come out and there's this new trend that that is occurring and it's strange. So I will wait till that movie uh I can watch it at home to go see it. But then also there's a trailer for The Woman King, uh with has Viola Davis. I'm very excited for just like a good representation of like an African culture. Um and I ideally it's gonna be super tasteful. So I'm hyped for that. But just going from there, now we're gonna get into for the first time some pre spoiler chat um for Thor Love and Thunder. So with that there's a lot of new themes getting introduced with that and some things that we want to kind of catch you up to. Uh if we we want to explain the mighty Thor to people. Ah uh, yes, absolutely. So the Mighty Thor is Jane Foster, or Dr. Jane Foster, I'm sorry, put some respect on her name. Uh, she's actually, in the comics, she's one of the one of the wielders of Mjolnir, she's one of the worthy, and she takes up the mantle of Thor after, at least in the comics, after a certain event happens and Thor loses his worthiness, but in the movie, however, she gets, well, she picks up the pieces of the hammer, which, uh, which allows her to become Thor. I mean, and the reason why, we'll get into why in the main spoiler chat, but she's a powerhouse. Uh, she, she's just as strong as Thor, and she's still willing to give them hands. Yeah, so we're going to get deeper into that with the actual spoiler section, but definitely seeing it for the first time, it might be a shock to a lot of people, but it has happened in the comics seeing um, Jane as the mighty Thor. Uh, I was nervous about it, because of i know what her being the mighty thor causes um Mm -hmm. but once we get into the next segment i'll go deeper into that so i was just interested to see if they would actually go that route which they ended up doing but yeah they definitely did a great representation of that and just a few more things uh two more actual topics to kind of touch on we have gore the god butcher as well as something that i know that you were super (laughs) hyper about the (laughs) necro (laughs) sword Oh, it is time. It is time. So, Gore the God Butcher, one of my favorite Thor villains of all time. Uh, we'll get into my thoughts about how he was portrayed in the movie later. But, uh, essentially, Gore the God Butcher, it's in his name. He butchering gods. Uh, after he basically finds out that one of his gods is a complete and total jerk and acts kind of like how the Greek gods are in uh, actual mythology... He says, uh, yeah, nah, I'm about to commit so much deicide that it is, that it's going to be etched in legends. And how does he do that? All black, the necrosword. <laughs> All right. So initially, 
like uh pre-2018 right the all black the naked sword it was just a weapon that was uh used by a seemingly dead god and gore just picks it up and it gives him enough power to kill any god and he gets stronger for each one he kills it allows him to create these monstrosities called black berserkers but uh and all that and he's allowed to do other things and he almost kills the entire greek or well, <laughs> not just the greek god the entire marvel god pantheon you know what i'm saying but uh but that ain't why i'm i was hyped about all black next sword because yes, it yeah. is time all right because all black next sword as the the 2018 Venom run by my boy Donnie Cates and Ryan Stegman, it is revealed that All Black is a symbiote. Mm -hmm. Let's go. Yes, sir. Connected with Venom. Yep, it's actually a symbiote. In fact, it's not just any symbiote. It was the first symbiote created by the god of symbiotes called Noel, which was supposed to be that god uh, that, he's, that, that was supposedly dead, but he wasn't dead. He was just knocked out. But, uh, oh man, but when that Necker Sword returned, it was a complete monster. It's, it's, I'm, 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 I'm getting ahead of myself. I'm a, <laughs> I'm a restrain myself for right now because of all black and what that means for the Mar MCU. I'm, I'm, I'm just going to hold back for right now. Well, yeah, we'll be touching on Noel in a few weeks when we get into our Venom character study. But that was just our pre spoiler chat just to kind of catch you up on some of the main characters and themes. Um, but from here, Ladies and gentlemen of Midgard, we are now preparing for our spoilers of Thor, Love and Thunder. And yes, so if you decide to stay and be, be content with the spoilers, go ahead and keep listening. Otherwise, if you don't, leave now or forever hold your peace and may the Lord have mercy on your soul. You have been warned. All right, so how are you feeling about the movie? Oh, man, and this is the part where I get into it. I thought it was a pretty solid movie. Uh, there's a lot of elements with it that I really liked in there. Uh, like, of course, there's just some of the, you know, the story itself and, like, what it means and then the stakes that that are put in there. It was like, okay, yeah, we get into the big stakes. Of course, there are some drawbacks, which we'll get into later, but... All in all, I feel like, hey, it was a super solid affair. Yeah, and for me, I'll be honest, that was my favorite Thor movie. I was smiling the entire time. I know that's blasphemous to a lot of Ragnarok fans, but I gotta be honest, like, my experience with Ragnarok, I've only seen it once. I think I wasn't in the mood to actually go to the movies when I saw it that one time, but um, I think the tone for me and concerning, like, his entire planet got blown up was too jokey. And then I was maybe it was just also in a bad mood. So I may need to watch Ragnarok again, but I loved Thor Love and Thunder so much. Yeah. Mm. So we can just like even start with the recap. Oh, yes. Yes. So pretty much un unlike most Marvel movies, right? This one just starts with uh, the origin of Gore uh, played by Christian Bale. You know, Mr. I don't wear hockey pads himself. <laughs> and he pretty much... Uh, you know, he had a daughter, which was something that's new to this movie. He didn't have a daughter in the comics. And she just straight up gets killed by uh, dehydration. I mean, yeah. when you own the stands of Tatooine, you, you best watch out. And yes, I did say Tatooine because uh, that's all you can think of because it was just a barren, a barren desert planet. How how many of that is is there in, uh, in Disney World? Right. <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so he... And of course, throughout the entire time, he's praying to his God, praying for water, praying for just hell, just doing doing what any religious person probably would in a tough time. That's just pray, pray outright to God. And eventually he, he finds him. And uh, unfortunately for him and for everybody else in the known universe, he did. He learns that his God is a, a bit of a jerk. Yeah, yeah at, at the very least, pretty much saying like, hey. There ain't no promised land for you, boy. There ain't no, uh, ain't no sunshine and rainbows. You're supposed to serve me and me only. And if you don't, you getting, you taking this fat L of life. And unfortunately, Gore was not having that. Because, uh, in the background, you see just this, uh, 
this dead body or this dead black body. I'm just like, um, excuse me, is that who I think it is? <laughs> and that's that's all that was in my mind. I was like, is that who I think it is? And uh and then the sword was just calling out to Gore, similar to how it did in the comics. I'm like, hold up. Right. And it just and it bonded to him. Not unlike how it did it in the comics. Oh, I'm I'm start uh, you can tell I'm getting into that mode. <laughs> <laughs> We're getting into the venom mode, but I'm, I'm restraining. I'm trying my best. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, so he uh, straight up marks of God and say like, you know what? I'm tired of all this. All gods must die. And yeah, that was a banger of an opening um, scene for me. I think what I really loved about it was like how it presented a crisis of faith. Um, because literally it's just like, okay, he 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 stumbles upon his God in this like, luscious like trees water fruit um this is literally after losing his daughter and he's saying like hey all of our people all of your worshipers all of your followers have died in your name um now that i've stumbled upon you can you help us and just like again like you said the god was a jerk and i think that's like what a lot of people can actually struggle with at times where it's just like you just think about the past three years of life and you're like yo what is happening right now um, and even like we both seen the black phone, not getting into the sports for that, but there's that one scene where the character goes, Jesus, what the heck? And I clean that up a lot, <laughs> but just like, what, like, what is going on right now? Um, and to just go through that where he's just like, yo, if the gods are selfish, if my God is selfish like that, then a lot of the other gods have to be. And that's also what happens in Greek mythology where you see so many selfish gods. Mm. Mm-hmm, mm -hmm. and we're gonna get into that later, but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so, like, moving on, then the credits start rolling, and it, and they actually, like, changed it up slightly, mm -hmm. uh, we get into just the new fun adventures of Thor and his friends, the Guardians of the Galaxy, yeah. or should I say the lackeys, because, uh, <laughs> he, he basically treated them like lackeys, he, he was pretty much just standing around in the background waiting for, Waiting for when things were bad enough mm -hmm. to where Star Lord had to swallow his pride to go ask him for help, <laughs> which I super relate to. <laughs> uh, but he it, he asked for help against this like rogue enemy forces, and Thor solos the entire army by himself. Yes, while the Guardians just watch and just utter just like, "Come on, man, you you wasted so much time right now." <laughs> exactly. And and then and then they go off and then they find an alert and alert that a bunch of gods were getting murdered, <laughs> and unfortunately, uh, unfortunately one of them was uh, and one of them happened to grab Thor's attention in that it was Sif, you mm -hmm. know, his his female companion all the way back in Thor one, you you remember Thor one right, <laughs> or Thor two, <laughs> no, no, don't do that. Oh no, no you don't. Oh dang, that's crazy. Uh, but <laughs> uh, but yeah. So essentially, he finds like his old friend, Lady Sif, is like still alive, but uh, she she's definitely def desperate for his help, and he decides to split off from the Guardians, which they were much too eager to do. Yeah, like, to leave him, Cork, and two hilarious goats, <laughs> screaming goats, <laughs> the screaming goats meme in live form mm -hmm. just to leave them on a new Asgard to go and see like what in the world's going on. Yeah. So just even with that, um, the gardens of the galaxy weren't that important to it as they should be just for this particular tale. So we don't have to focus too much, but we do see that, uh, star Lord leaves Thor with some just like advice of like, you need to find something. Cause even like in the, kind of like the prologue of the story Korg is telling just like how Thor is kind of basically miserable at the time um he doesn't really have a lot going on and then also like after that scene ends we cut to Jane Foster and here's where here's where this movie felt kind of the most real of all the movies where it's like Jane has cancer Stay and it's four. just like ouch like it it literally was just like okay like seeing sickness in a like a real sickness not like a vague sickness mm -hmm. and it's just like oh boy a lot of people can relate to that and then going in so in the comics when jane uses mirror and has the powers of thor it actually weakens her um body even significantly more so she can't fight it off so that's kind of what we see later 
uh, going into it. But at the time, she has stage four cancer, so she's trying to look for all possible solutions. And she realizes that, oh, maybe I, she hears Mjolnir calling out to her. So she also goes to New Asgard. Yeah, yeah. And one of the things I really liked is that like it really explored like her and just like how she's dealing with like the five stages of grief when it comes to having that cancer. I was like, dang, that's actually super real. Yeah, it was tough, yeah. Yeah, but uh yeah, she goes up to New Asgard, right as they're doing a new play, <laughs> new stage production, you know, with Matt Damon as Loki, Sam Neill as Odin. You got one of the Hemsworth brothers as Thor <laughs> and his special guest, Melissa McCartney. Yo, Ella. the theater broke out in laughter when she popped up on screen. <laughs> I'm still laughing now. That was too funny. I died. That was hilarious. I died. But, but yeah, she, she manages to procure Milnir, and then we cut back over to Thor. Who pretty much, uh, him and Corey, they find the dead body of one of the gods, which was taken literally straight out of the comic book. Mm -hmm. And it's like, dang. And he he pretty much goes back to New Asgard with Lady Sip, right as uh, Gore decides to pull some heinous chicanery. Yeah, it's crazy. I was like, when I saw Gore's powers, because I wasn't too familiar with him, I was like, oh, is this Shikamaru of the Naro clan? <laughs> Using these shadow monsters? Uh, just like grappling, gripping people up. So they were attacking New Asgard, um, and then Thor pulls up, starts saving a lot of the citizens. And it's a lot of like really cool fight scenes in this movie. And then he sees Mjolnir just like whirling around, reconstruct it, no longer in pieces like how um, Hela left it. And then he calls out to it, but then it comes back and we see Jane, the mighty Thor. And it's like a really cool scene. Yep, yep. It, it was actually super great too because uh, Thor, he's just dumbfounded. Yeah. He's like, hold up. So my ex weapon is with my ex girlfriend. <laughs> and we get into like some whole. It's not even a love triangle. This is like a love. No, it's not even a love square. It's a love pentagram. Because you got Thor, Jane, Jane trying to rekindle. We got Thor, uh, Stormbreaker, and Milnir, which is it is hilarious that that Taika Waititi, the director, he managed to give Stormbreaker so much personality. Oh yeah, without without with just it being a a whole axe, and it got so much personality. I'm just, I was almost dying internally. <sighs> but, but yeah, so they managed to stave off pretty much the Black Berserkers. But uh, unfortunately, Gore, he was too nice with the Necrosword and was giving Thor those hands. Right. But fortunately, he had a Mighty Thor and Valkyrie, the, the Queen of Asgard, uh, Slay Queen. And, <laughs> she, and they were there to help him, but he took the key. It's, he yeah. decided to... To be one step below Anakin Skywalker and mm -hmm. decide to take them kids. Yeah, so just like Shikimaru, he had a plan within a plan. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but so then we go from there, they have a town hall meeting, but we then discover this kind of just what Meech was talking about, the the interplay of kind of Stormbreaker having a personality. So a lot of that out throughout the movie, Thor, since Mjolnir is like literally a part of his personality, and then even in Ragnarok, we saw like he's like uh, Odin asked him, are you the king of hammers or are you the king of thunder? The god of thunder. And so he calls out to Mjolnir, but then Stormbreaker literally pops up kind of like a jealous girlfriend, like, hey, good, thanks for calling out to me. <laughs> and it's so funny. I see you had it like that. I was thinking like, hey, what, what you doing, my boy? <laughs> like, what you doing, playboy? My G. <laughs> So yeah, so then even just like uh, Thor is like, okay, I'm going to look for the kids. And he, he accesses the Bifrost, but Stormbreaker is just acting wonky at this point. So they need a way to channel it. Uh, wonky? Nah, she usually way into diva mode at this point. <laughs> but uh, so they decide like, all right, we're going to use like one of the boats that we have, you know, to transport people from New Asgard to civilization. Right. And bitter with Stormbreaker and have the two screaming goats as uh, the chariot, <laughs> if you will. And they decide, okay, we need an army. So let's go to Omnipotent City where all of the gods are. So that way we can raise an army and get help. 
Ah, now let's let's get into this part. So when they go into the assembly of gods, which is a pretty interesting scene, just kind of seeing the different gods uh, portrayed. But then we see Zeus played by Russell Crowe. Mm -hmm. And he just, the accent. One thing that I have to say about Thor movies that I, I just even thought about, I think it takes a long time for people to actually lock into a Thor movie um, because it feels so performative. Uh, just with like, it feels like everyone's going, oh, I need to put on a Norse accent or I need to put on a Greek accent. Where like, mm -hmm. even with uh, Zeus, I was like, what kind of accent is this? Um, it's trying to be Greek. So like, yeah, in like a normal Avenger movie, it's like, okay, this is Thor. But when it's a Thor movie and everyone's talking like that, it kind of, it takes a long, it take it took like a while for me to actually like, okay, I'm settled. I get this now. But with that, yeah. So then Zeus, who um, is like, the highest of regard of the guards comes down and <laughs> he, he's basically the <laughs> Zeus from the uh, Greek mythology uh, without all of the you know not safe for work chicanery that he does uh, <laughs> yes. actually cheating on uh, Hera well, actually we don't know that part yet uh, <laughs> I'm sure they not, don't explore it and also did you notice that like they actually like did a whole thing where they say hey look it's the god of carpentry <laughs> I'm like, hold up, y'all really, y'all really do that? Y'all really put Jesus Christ into this movie? <laughs> and, and yes, they did. But uh, but yeah, so uh, they pretty much just go up, and Thor pretty much has to try to convince Zeus to help him with everything. And of course, uh, Zeus flicks off uh, Thor's clothing, revealing his bare behind to. For all the women in the world to see, uh, I'm pretty sure that's why half of my theater was straight women. Um, I'm not even capping about that. But uh, uh, yeah, and then and then Zeus just comes down. And he's just like, "Listen, bro, hey, we gods, so we ain't got." And Gore's been killing nothing but a uh, little petty gods. Like we ain't got nothing to worry about. Mm -hmm. Just stay up here. We gonna have fun. And then Thor just keep being adamant. It's like, no, no, no. If he's gonna come for, he's coming for them. Mm -hmm. What makes you think he gonna not come for y'all? And he's like, look. And he's like, look. Uh, again, these and he's kidnapped like a bunch of kids. It's like, but there is guardian kids though, right. so that ain't our problem. And then and then Thor decides to pull a big movie. Say like, oh, a word. So. So Zeus is sweet out here in these streets? <laughs> Zeus is scared of the god Butcher? And and that's what set him off. Yeah, so then we see Zeus come down and is like, yeah, I am scared. But then we, but in that like miniature talk, we see what the real goal of Gore the God Butcher is. So the goal is to get to eternity, Ooh. which is this uh, hallowed place secret. And if you were to reach the heart of eternity, the first person to reach is, gets whatever wish they want. And for someone that's named Gore the God Butcher, guess what they would want it to do? Um, but still, um, Zeus is not wanting to help them. So he's like, okay, if you're not going to send an army, let us get the Thunderbolt. Which, I mean, that's that wasn't happening. Uh, so then we have this fight scene, breaks out, uh, they free Thor, and then we see Zeus get his own Thunderbolt right to the chest. Uh, but not before uh, he took out our boy Korg. Uh, it was it was a pretty sad moment, keyword being moment because it was real that uh, he was alive. Yeah, just like, his face. <laughs> yep, it was just his his face, not a head. His face, which uh, he then straps onto the back of Valkyrie's head, <laughs> as they kind of. I was like, is this supposed to be like a two face reference or something? Hmm. You no, know I'm not getting, getting into that. But uh, but yeah, then. Then Zeus got caught lacking, and uh, and Thor decided, hey, you know what? I thought I thought you were my hero, and this kind of became like a semi-recurring theme. It's like, dang, don't meet your gods, don't meet your heroes. Yeah. Uh, Gore met his, and he turned into the to a whole god butcher. <laughs> Gore met his, and uh, he decided to put a hole in, in God's chest. Yes. With the with his own thunderbolt, that was crazy. Yeah. So just moving along, we then get uh, interpersonal relationship discussion. We're gonna get on into that in later in the podcast, but just for the plot purposes. So they uh, end up going onto this planet, and they <laughs> it was so small, and I was like, wait, is that the other world from uh, <laughs> is King Kai there? <laughs> <laughs> 
Yes. And so they get to this world, uh, which is more of a moon or a rock in space, if you kind of think about it. Yeah. So uh, it loses all color. It's just pure darkness. And at this point in the movie, I was like, I feel like they haven't given Gore enough of a screen time or like a connection to like kind of prop him up because i saw articles where it was like oh gore is the best uh marvel villain so far and i was like okay i haven't seen him in the movies <laughs> anymore but then he has this really cool scene where he uh just like creeps out of the darkness and yo know, it's like a trap and we learned that stormbreaker is the key to accessing the door to eternity because it has the bifrost Yep, and with that, uh, Gore again springs his trap because he kidnapped all the kids, and he knew the kids would, uh, especially uh, this one specific kid who's Heimdall's son. Mm-hmm. You remember Idris Elba, Heimdall? I'm sure you can't forget my man's. Um, <laughs> but but yeah, his son also has the pop, his dad's abilities, and he calls out to Thor. That's why they go on this merry adventure. But uh, yeah, he springs his trap to where. Because at the beginning, Jane figures out what the plan is, so she chucks a uh, Stormbreaker out into the out to, to the void. Yes, and not referencing uh, the void in Marvel. I'm not getting <laughs> into that, but uh, but yeah. So Gore decides to use his his symbiote, not symbiote, to, to entrap all three of them, mm-hmm. and says like, and starts the. Uh, Starts so pulling a uh, pulling an Anakin and choking the life out of Padme. Oh wait, sorry, I mean Jane Foster. And he's like, "Listen, you gotta call Stormbreaker, or I'm murking both of them in front of you." Mm-hmm. So unfortunately, he does. And then they get into a little squabble, a little scrap. Yep, and a really cool fight scene. The choreography in this movie was really good for like sword fighting mm-hmm. and everything. Well, not just sword fighting, but, uh, you know, just hammer fighting. Hammer fighting, and lightning bolt fighting. Yeah, yeah. It's, everybody had, like, something to do, and everybody was out here. Unfortunately, again, Gore is that god, Butcher, <laughs> and he uh, he wounds Valkyrie, takes her out of the game. Right. And then, uh, and unfortunately, Jane gets separated from her hammer, which reverts her back to her cancer-ridden state. Which so. has worsened. Yeah, which is completely horrible. And and then they say, like, okay, it's time for us to leave because the, the children were not there. Right. So, so Thor tries to call the Bifrost and get them out of there. But but uh, again, Gore decides to take a, a page out of Hela's book. And says, like, oh, nah, fam. <laughs> give, me your, give me your Stormbreaker. Which was really cool. Yep, and then... And of course, not Thor out to where they get sent back to New Asgard. But uh, now Gore has the Stormbreaker in order to reach eternity. Yep. <laughs> and so from there, it's just kind of more or less getting the pieces in place for the final battle. So Jane is back in the hospital. Thor learns what Mjolnir is doing to her condition. Um, and he wants her to stay in the hospital. He's like, OK, I can handle this myself. And just kind of, and Valkyrie, like you said, was out of the equation. So from there, he pulls out and kind of they go to the gates of eternity. And one of my favorite scenes happens uh, where just like with the kids in that fight scene, I was so hyped. <laughs> oh, boy. Yep. Yep. So, so it's in Thor. He's like, you know what? It's time for that last stand. It's like eternity is about to be reached. So Thor, this, so, so Thor and all the kids... Cause he arrives to where they all are. Uh, don't don't ask me like how he gets there because uh, Thunderbolt. That's- uh, no, he has Axel. Oh, oh yeah, that's right. So yeah, Axel has the same powers as Heimdall, so he can. I don't remember what the power is specifically called, but he can project where his location is for Thor to see him. Yeah, he projects where he can see him, but then he, but then how does he physically get there? Yeah, that's fair. That's the part where I'm just like. So I guess Thunderbolt just that's just my <laughs> our magic answer for, but uh, yes. that doesn't explain how somebody else gets there. But uh, that's neither here nor there. <laughs> they use the book from um Doctor Strange. <laughs> hmm. 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 But uh. <laughs> but yeah. So uh, in order. So yeah. So uh, Thor he's like, okay, kids, because Gore is like, you know what? In order to hold these people back, he's gonna summon all of his black berserkers to. 
to go and fight them. One of them happened to look like a giant spider. I'm not going to get into the implications of that one. Uh, but but so he's like, okay, kids, grab whatever you got. He gives like one of the most hilarious speeches possible to children. He's like, okay. And then he gives a slight uh, enchantment. He's like, hey, we're going to give all these kids temporarily, keyword temporarily, the powers of Thor. I, I did not know he could share his powers like that. Um, so essentially, like, all the kids get, they just, like, pick up weapons. It's kind of discarded rocks or tools. One girl has a teddy bear, which is hilarious. And they all get just, like, supercharged Thor powers and start fighting these, like, these shadow feasts. And, oh, my goodness, that fight was so good. Yeah, it kind of reminded me a bit of the Shazam movie. Yes, yes, when he shares the, uh, the yeah. yeah, when he shares the powers of Thor, but, uh... But yeah, so he pretty much does that while the kids are out here slaying monsters left and right. Thor out here with the Thunderbolt fighting, fighting Gore. He it appears that he may have had the upper hand because now he knows that like okay, the Necker Sword is his weakness, and if that gets destroyed, he dies. Mm-hmm. Uh, so they so he trying to destroy that, and then in comes Jane. Yep, as as mighty Thor. Oh my goodness. So they they decided to pull the fight back meme and <laughs> and uh decided to run Gore's pockets. Jumped him. Yep, he jumped him so so badly that uh his that his necrosaur got destroyed, but unfortunately within the shattered pieces end up going into Milnir. Which is crazy, yeah. And he like and Jane like she looks at Thor and this is the greatest part is like you can tell like just with the sheer acting power of Chris Hemsworth throughout the entire fight as soon as Jane appeared his face just instead of goes from like you know a battle hardened warrior in battle or like a just jokester having a good time no it is pure just distraught and concerned because he knows he's gonna lose her yeah that she she ain't making it out of this fight Mm -hmm. whether it's gonna be in battle or by the cancer right and she decides to pull the ultimate sacrifice and she destroys the hammer which also which also has like the pieces of the necro sword so now the cancer got her and what i really do appreciate about this movie is they let jane eat like Mm -hmm. when she said i'm the mighty thor she meant i'm the mighty thor because like it wasn't like her like not knowing how to use the hammer and it's like um just like stumbling about not being incompetent she was like fighting she was just like on top of it she felt confident and like in that last scene where uh gore calls her lady thor and she's like you have lost your mind i am the mighty thor like you lost the prop brother It, it makes you go like yeah she was eating it's like Dang, that's what six months of training got you? Yes. And I, I really appreciate it because it's kind of like what we talked about um in our woman episode, where it's just like, just let them be a person and just let them go crazy. And th- that's what they let Jane do. And she just like, again, the choreography, you saw how like how buffed up Natalie Portman got mm-hmm. for the for the job. Mm-hmm. Um, so just like even after breaking the hammer, in the meantime, uh, Gore had already used Stormbreaker to kind of open the door to eternity. So then, when we get into a little bit later discussion, I kind of have some comments about eternity and what that could, like, what they've been teasing, I feel like. But, um, so essentially, he's there. Also, Thor and Jane are transported. Jane is literally, like, dying now. Like, officially dying. And Thor try. He doesn't really fight to convince him. He's like, hey... You can do what you want to do, but I don't think what you want to do is kill the gods, actually. I think you just want your daughter. Yep. Uh, Thor employs the top no jutsu, straight out of Naruto. <laughs> and he manages, like, hey, what you need is the love right now. He's like, why would I want love? He's like, listen, everybody yearns for love. Mm-hmm. And little did we know, he, he he's like, okay. And he wishes for his daughter to come back to life. Yeah. And all the time, like, he kept calling her my love and my love. And he's like, oh, that's sweet. That's sweet. And and then, and then like, with that, of course, Thor is with Jane. She's in her last moments. Mm-hmm. They fully confess their love to each other. Of course, it had to be when, when both of them, well, one of them's dying. Of course. And, and it also parallels how uh, Gore held his daughter as she died. Yep. Yep. A hundred percent. And... And then, and then Jane passes away. Like she dies, but 
but Gore, of course, he's also dying in his daughter's arms, but Gore is looking at Thor and seeing that, that love that he has for Jane, who was a mortal. Yes. Because he recognized, like, hey, she's just a mortal woman who gained power like he did. Right. And he's like, take care of her. And then he dies. Yeah. So just going from there, we see that now Thor is essentially a foster dad or a stepdad in a sense. And that even the new daughter, uh, who's love, and she she can wield Stormbreaker, which is pretty cool. And it mirrors the opening of the movie where they're just kind of running together with the weapon going into battle. Yep. And it also has another parallel to the story of Odin and Loki, mm-hmm. you know, taking the child, the orphan child of your op. Right. And just raising them. I was like, dang, I really hope she does not end up like Loki and go to the dark side. And also, <laughs> her name is actually Love. And that's where the title of the movie comes in. Mm-hmm. Thor, Love and Thunder. That's the name of the gods that they are given by Korg, who's regaling the story to, to more people. Yes. And then for that essentially ends the movie. And for the mid credit scenes, oh boy, I got hyped because we see that Zeus, who has a hole in his chest, isn't actually dead. And he's just talking about the god, well, how... The citizens used to praise the gods, but now they just want heroes. And then we're like, okay, who who is he talking to? Well, it doesn't even seem like who's he talking to at first. It's kind of just like he's it's talking to yeah, his girls or whatever. And then we see someone, and then all of a sudden, I'm, I see it, and I, I'm trying to recognize who the actor is. And then it's like, Roy Kent! Roy Kent! <laughs> he's here! He's there! He's every bleeping where! Roy Kent! So apparently he's talking to Hercules, and he's sending him after Thor. Hercules! 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 <laughs> so the actor who, uh, if you're a Ted Lasso fan, uh, uh, Roy Kent is playing Hercules, and it teases that, okay, Thor is coming back. So we're going to get kind of uh, similar to God of War, not completely, but... Thor versus Hercules. Yep, yep. Uh, I, I actually said it like in the theater. I was like, War of the Gods? <laughs> yeah, so I was like, okay, here we like, go. Here we go. It's time, it's time. We, we about to see the, the anti-Thor part of them. Okay, hold up. We about to get into that later. But, uh, but yeah, and then, of course, it wouldn't be a Marvel movie if there weren't two post credit scenes. And the end credits is that Jane, of course, like after she died, she ends up in Valhalla where she runs into Heimdall, yes. who thanks her for taking care of her son, and she just has an awestruck look on her face. Yes. So I thought that was a good ending. Um, so just going from there, what, what, what do you feel went right? Oh, man. Well, I think like what went right is definitely like the stakes a bit, cause especially in concerns to Jane and like her cancer, because like, each time, like, you see her with the hammer, you really feel like, oh, snap. And then, like, every time she lets it go, you immediately feel the impact of, like, yeah, that cancer is killing her. Yeah. And, of course, uh, like, the romance bits, like, it it kind of went right in most part of, we'll get more to that later. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I really find that, like, Gore's emotional aspect is like especially when it comes to him and his daughter i was like okay that's really nice that's really neat especially considering the fact that the daughter is a mcu original character yeah as i said so like she she does not appear anywhere else uh the the soundtrack straight fire banger. straight pressure banger after banger and and really like some of the funny bits really landed yeah. So yeah, that's that's kind of so what I had about what we're right. What about you? For me, I again just like the realness of it. I also like how they made gore relatable in a sense of just like you saw it. It wasn't kind of how they did Ronin, where it's just like okay, I'm just going to destroy everything for the sake of destroying everything. Um, but just even going with that, I like how just like Thor kind of just like you felt like his evolution continuing where. This is just another step. Um, so I really am looking forward to see what they do with him moving forward. Because for me, walking into it, I thought it was going to be over. Like, this was the last Thor movie. Um, but now we know Thor will at return. least he will return in some capacity. So I also like that. And just like the fight scenes and choreography, as I uh, mentioned before. 
Yeah. Ah, yep, yep, absolutely, absolutely. And now, our dear viewers, it's time for the awards. Yes. All right, so our first award is actually a new one. It's entitled Music for the Soul. It's essentially where, like, hey, if there's, like, a song or anything in, like, the soundtrack that was just really great and really fire, we want to acknowledge that. So for this award, we have Guns N' Roses, Welcome to the Jungle, Ooh, yeah. played at the beginning of the film when Thor is just out here wrecking a whole army on his own with the Guardians of the Galaxy. And it was just so hilarious. It was so fire. I was like, yes. I haven't listened to this song in ages, but yes. So, hey, Guns N' Roses, come get your award. For our next award, we have The Spotlight is Yours. And this is going to be an interesting one because it's going to an inanimate object. So I am giving it to Stormbreaker. So kind of like we mentioned before, <laughs> the relate Stormbreaker was like was on one in this movie, just like how Thor is reacting to Mjolnir. Um, but Stormbreaker scenes elicited the most laughs in the theater. But it was also surprisingly one of the most important pieces of the story. So being able to access the Bifrost just in general in terms of getting to Gore himself, but then also opening the gates to eternity. So Stormbreaker, every time it's on scene, just spotlight is yours. So come get your award. And our next award is I Need a Hero. Ah, Dr. Jane Foster, even though you are in Valhalla, come get your award because you are out here being the savior of this whole entire ordeal, especially knowing that you had cancer and knowing that the hammer will kill you. You come in to save everybody at the end of the day and you gave your life for it. No wonder you're in Valhalla because you are a true warrior and true champion. Come get your award. For the next award, it's another new award. It's called Just Kiss Already. So this can only go to one couple throughout the movie, but it just encapsulates a, a moments or a couple where you're just literally like, please just kiss already. Thor Stormbreaker? <laughs> if only, but we got Thor and the Mighty Thor, or Dr. Jane Foster. Uh, just for, I think, a romance done well and the looks of love that they gave to each other and how it saved the day in the end. So, come get your award. Our next award is the Jump Out of Your Seat Award. It's uh, where you just jump out of your seat because the moment is so exciting and so amazing. I give it to when Thor gave his powers to all the children. And because you gave all the children the powers of gods and they went out here and just started murking everything, especially the girl with the bunny yes. and her just screaming out into the ether. It was just too much. I was like, just just come get your award, Thor, because that was a jump out of your seat moment. Kids, you can get parts of the word too. <laughs> I mean, yes. I mean, it is. It's part of the the prophecy of being Thor. And for our final award, we have Stealing Money Award. So this goes to an actor or actors that appear in a big film, and they have a minimal role that's only used for laughs. But for stealing money, this is going to both Matt Damon and Melissa McCarthy. <laughs> so seeing both Loki. <laughs> And Hella, well, seeing Matt Damon again as Loki had me crying in the play. And then when Melissa McCarthy came out, there were laughs for literally like a minute straight in the theater. I was so shocked from just both of them literally popping up in a Marvel movie. You stole money. I'm proud of you. Come get the bag. Come get this award. <laughs> 
So it, this is just another good award segment. We're just preparing for uh, the next tier. Wait, whoa, whoa! I thought I thought we were done here. Um, I'm getting played off. Apparently, there's another award, and it's about to get dark in here. I'm out. Ah, uh, yes, and this award is very special because it is the Black Air Force Award. There is only one true monstrosity that is worthy of this round table. His name is Gore the God Butcher. His his comic uh, iteration, he was just a straight monstrosity. You know, he out here torturing the God of Torture. He, he managed to kill gods in so many different ways and fashions. It was, it was, it was kind of disturbing how creative he got. And, and he was also just a straight up menace. He tortured Thor so badly that Thor got PTSD in the comics when he ran into him again. If Thor gets PTSD, you know you a whole menace to society. Cause as far as we know in the MCU, the only other person who did that was Big Pappy Thanos. So, I mean, what else is there? The man's killing gods. People out here killing uh, other people for less. Nah, this man said, no, we going up the tier chain. We said, nah, you people is nothing but sheep to me. You guys are not even worth the the salt beneath my feet. I'm going straight for the big game. Them gods. Everybody, every single god can come run this fade. Unless your name is Null, God of the Symbiots. But we ain't get into that right now, because this is all about you, Gore. You and the Necrosword, because both of y'all are straight menaces to society. Please, get your black pins, even though I know you ain't gonna wear them. <laughs> yes, so, most respect for Gore. Um, glad that you have the new forces. So, from there, we will respectfully get into our tiers now. So for the tiers for this one, we're going through mythological Norse places. So starting at the bottom, we have Ragnarok. Uh, not the movie, just like Ragnarok is literally the end of Asgard and everything. So that would be a bottom tier movie. Next, we have Jotunheim, the frozen place of the giants. From there, Midgard, which has mid in it. So a simple movie. From there, Idrisil, which is the tr world tree. Uh, above that, Asgard, and then finally Valhalla. So, what tier would you give this? Ah, oh, man, yeah, I definitely like liked and enjoyed this movie. Like, I, uh, I definitely love like different aspects of it. Uh, I do feel like okay, so like the comedy, like it was there, it was good, but for like such a serious storyline, like it was a, uh, I was like, man, you, you could have dialed that one back a bit. Like, you could have had a much bigger marriage between the two. Um, and also because again, Gore is like one of my is is my favorite Thor villain, even above Loki. Uh, but with that, I would give it a a Yggdrasil, yeah, or Yggdrasil. Sorry, 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 my people. <laughs> but yes, I, I give it a solid B tier. Yes, for well, for me that you explained it, that was literally my Ragnarok point about the comedy. So, which is hilarious. Um, but for me, it was definitely I haven't stopped smiling since I've seen this movie. I'm um, just thinking about it. The action is great in my opinion. The music is top tier. Um, I really love the story and just like again, it's, it's, when when I first saw Jane, I didn't know how how in depth or how much they would like let her eat. They absolutely let her eat in this movie. And so from there, I just really loved it. And if I watch it again, maybe my tier might change, but I'm going Asgard. A tier movie, edge of my seat. I loved it and I would totally watch it again. And just from there, we will get into our sponsor for the day. Are you an aspiring actor, playful playwright, or maybe a costume connoisseur? Asgardian Theaters is the place for you. We specialize in all Norse mythos, from the legendary tales of Valhalla to the torturous fate of Ragnarok, and even Thor's predestined battle of Jormon. We are the home for your talents and entertainment. Entry to the place requires access to the Pyfrost. Okay, so for this portion of our discussion, we're going into a bigger Marvel discussion in general. This won't be our super deep dive, but right now we're going to start splashing into the, splashing into the pool for a bit. Yes, yes. 
And now that we are here, it's time for our random theory segment. Time where, hey, sometimes we just go out and we find like random theories we want to talk about. And preferably, it'll be done by, we preferably get entries by you guys to our listeners. Yes. Found in our emails at blurredcity22 at gmail.com or in our Discord chat, which is located in our Instagram. Mm Mm-hmm. So, what type of random fan theory did you have? For me, I think that what I teased earlier, so they had the Eternals movies. They also showed Eternity. If you look at both of the designs of them, they look like another bigger, major Marvel villain. And we're also getting the Fantastic Four. So I think at some point, we're going to get Galactus. They Even if you look at uh, Dormammu, who is kind of just like the head floating or whatever, but I think we're going to get real Galactus, not Cloud Galactus. Yes, <laughs> yes. Fantastic Four. We don't talk about that Galactus. <laughs> we don't talk about him at all. But yeah, I actually had a pretty similar theory, uh, except mine is leans more towards a certain, uh, certain character who I've been talking about throughout this entire uh, video, because as you guys know, at the end of No Way Home, Yes, the uh, the venom of the of the Tom Hardy universe. He manages to leave a piece of the venom symbiote back behind. Mm-hmm. Now you got Gore the God Butcher with the Nerka Sword and with all the symbiote affectations of that, and with the fact that there was just a whole black god like in the background. I mean, this is this is prime null material. Mm. No god of the symbiotes, folks. I I pray that he comes to the MCU. Probably not for like a super long time because he's a he's a deep character who you gotta build towards. I feel like Sony won't let Marvel have that though. Listen, uh, hopefully by the time that they get everything set up, we have Disney buying out Sony. <laughs> I'm 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 hoping for that outcome because we need all we need all of Marvel back together. We can't have spider-man just be separated from everybody that's true i don't care if it causes a whole uh economic issue with disney being the corporate superpower but hey anything for the mouse Uh, i i feel like we're more likely to see i mean because sony is going to keep spider-man due to the spider-verse just movies from there like that's going to be good there those are going to be good enough to keep them like Owning Spider-Man, in my opinion. Again, just buy the whole studio. <laughs> R.I.P. Fox. Yep, just like him. And and then now we get into our make your case. Yes. If you guys remember from the time when we had Autumn and Britta guest starring, this is the time where we ask like just a series of questions, and we gotta just take a stance on them. Mm-hmm. And these just a couple of them that uh, we just have. So, hey, we just gotta go go out here and start with the best one. Who has the best solo films? Okay, and for this one, we are disqualifying... Well, I'm personally disqualifying any team movies. So, um, any event... Well, obviously, adventure movies don't count. But also, Guardians of the Galaxy does not count. Like, they can't go in it. And if you have only one film, you're also disqualified. So, Black Panther is disqualified for me. Just because it only has one film, it's not fair to compare it to all the other films. Also, Shang-Chi. And then, we'll keep Ant-Man for now, but... We'll hey, Eternals is technically disqualified for both reasons. Yeah, actually. that's disqualified. So, from well, the real answer, it's obviously Spider-Man. <laughs> but from there, I will go... Actually, before No Way Home... I would say that Captain America had the best solo films because Captain America, the first Avenger is really good compared to all the first entries for the other movies. Captain America, the winter soldier is incredible and it introduces a lot of good characters. And then this next one is kind of cheating because it's really an Avengers movie, but Captain America civil war is one of the best Marvel movies before uh, all of the infinity saga movies. So in my after Spider-Man, because No Way Home takes the cake, and the other and Homecoming and Far From Home are solid enough to like hold its own. But yeah, it would definitely be that. Yep, yep. Uh, I, I'm pretty much mostly there with you. Like the Spider-Man No Way series is is out of there. 
uh, the Captain America. I'm, I'm taking that off the table because uh, it's it's all. I mean, those two are the goaded ones, right? Uh, and technically, since this is since uh because of No Way Home, I would say the Sam Raimi trilogy. <laughs> Look, because uh, I mean, it, like this. That's my personal answer because uh, hey, No Way Home opened that floodgate. So uh, <laughs> so I'm putting Sam Raimi's trilogy in there. You you can't mess with Toby. He he had great movies. You got too many memes. Goat goat goblin. <laughs> Go octopus! Oh my gosh, yes. And uh, and then Spider Man Three gave us the some of the best memes, and it's the first introduction of my favorite character, despite how much they completely boulderize him. Um, but but besides that, that's a that's my pick. But if you don't count, if you don't count that uh cop out answer, yeah, one hundred percent. If you don't count that, I'm gonna have to go with Black Panther. Like, it is a super amazing solo film. It's made by us. Right. Made for us. And Chadwick Boseman. R.I.P. R.I.P. To, to, to a legend. He's a real life superhero. Mm-hmm. And it's just, again, just a display of African culture. Uh, sure, there's only one solo movie out right now. That's, that's the only reason I couldn't count it. But... Uh, I I do count it so so like I have no restrictions on that at all except for the team movie stuff like that was my only restriction so best solo film Black Panther okay it, after you take out the others <laughs> so going from there best best OG Avenger so that I'm setting it as a cutoff point Age of Ultron so any Avengers that get added after that I'm not counting okay so no Spider Man all right. Yeah. Ah, I, okay, okay. So, best OG Avengers. So between the OG six, pretty much, because uh, my girl Scarlet Witch, she was great and all, but I'm not gonna count her. Uh, and then Quicksilver, RIP. Mm-hmm. Um, I would probably say between the OG six, I'm giving it to Cap. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, again, I was Team Cap throughout. Well, actually, no. In Civil War, I was hashtag Team Spidey. But uh, <laughs> it was like I was not Iron Man or Cap. I was Team Spidey. But uh, but really, like Captain America, he's like the ideal superhero, right? Right. He's kind of like Superman in that way. But if Superman was actually done right and not by Zack Snyder, oh, come on. <laughs> Look, look, no no disrespect to Zack Snyder, but you, you kind of lost the plot as to, like, what Superman represents. But but this is the Marvel episode, so I'm not going <laughs> to get into that right now. Okay, so, again, Captain America, ideal hero, but he does have faults, and you see some of those faults come back to bite him, a la Civil War. Mm-hmm. So he's just, like, real about it, and he just doesn't compromise on his beliefs, which is like, yeah. Yeah, that's what I have to aspire towards. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so for me, uh, see, I'm a really huge Hulk fan, but Marvel, they 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 kind they, of fumble in the back. With they Hulk. fumbled him so hard, that's why I couldn't pick Hulk. So you see, the, I think the issue is is that Universal has the rights to yep. the Hulk. Um, I'm not sure like the specific details, but like essentially, it's kind of like a Sony Spider-Man situation. So like that's why they haven't really done a solo Hulk film. But, like, he literally got bodied by Thanos, and everyone made fun of him for, like, an entire year. Yeah, I was like, I, I couldn't do it. So, I'm going with Iron Man, not because of his solo films, because the second one is bad, and then the third one, I hate it for reasons that aren't Iron Man related. But I think just, like, seeing his journey, how he kickstarted everything, and just how he even was, like, a father of the Spider-Man was so hype, and just, like when we lost him it meant something um and i think that like not a lot of characters when they died meant something in my opinion so, and then like he just kind of like kickstarted and just like how iconic he was so yeah. in terms of the mcu the best og adventure is iron man in my opinion nice nice all right so our next question is who would you like to see get a spinoff uh from that movie i would like to see valkyrie get a spinoff um and try to like recreate the sisterhood of valkyries but with that also like i the thing is that it also got kind of got teased uh beforehand which so when she got stabbed i was like okay i guess she's not gonna die um but 
I would love to see Corey get like a five minute introduction, like kind of like his own little skit between each movie. So kind of like the Pixar shorts before a Pixar movie. I would love if they handled it like that. That would be incredible. Uh, it would be incredible if you got uh, Korg and you got Luis from the Ant-Man films <laughs> and you just put them in a room together and just have them just narrate that. That would be comedy gold. Mm-hmm. I would die for that. Nice. And apparently there's actually a cut where Luis recaps all of Marvel. Marvel released that. That <laughs> is money. Come on. I know y'all ain't afraid of money, so go ahead and release it. Uh, but man, I think for me, out of everybody there who who's there, I mean, uh, I think I would probably say I would actually like to see Axel. Like, mm. well, kind of like the story of Axel, like how he gets like grow up and kind of become the new Heimdall. Uh, I mean, as you said, like Valkyrie is is more than likely going to get her own spinoff already. So I'm like, OK, so well, that answer is off the table because right. it's practically already supposed to happen. Thor and then uh, Love, I'm like, uh, eh, well, we're going to get into that later. Uh, and then and then Jane. R.I.P. R.I.P. Would but, you want to see a time skip with Axel, though? Or him as a kid? No, time skip. Okay. 100% time skip. Boruto. <laughs> yes, because I, I, I ain't dealing with kids. I don't, I don't do well with kids, all right? Uh, especially child actors. Um, but with that, I... Well, most child actors, it's like, eh, hit or miss. Right. But, like, with him, like, again, just seeing him older, perhaps, like, with his Asgardian training and, like, with him having his father's powers, it'd be good to, like, see him, like, okay, I'm the new Heimdall. I'm the new, uh, yeah, I'm the new steer for the for Asgard. It's like, right. let's go. That'll be definitely cool. All right, so a question that I have that's going to be kind of controversial. Oh, boy. But Here we go. Can Thor as a character stand on his own because if we see the first Thor movie and the second one he was the main attraction mm. and people absolutely hate those movies was it Chris Hemsworth's fault no um but then we see him in Avengers uh and in every Avengers movie he has a solid role in the first Avengers he no he bodies the Hulk which is a, a really cool scene then in Age of Ultron he has a really good scene and Infinity War, he has the best entrance that we've seen, well, until Endgame. Uh, what do you mean, Thanos? And then in Endgame, like, he has a really great story. But then also, if we go to Ragnarok, that's not just a Thor movie. It's Valkyrie. It's essentially Planet Hulk, which, if we're being honest, a lot of people were hype about that. And then it's, a, like, a lot more of Loki. And they make their Avengers. So that's a really, uh, he stood with a team. Mm -hmm. And then in Love and Thunder, we have the quick tease with the Guardians of the Galaxy. And then again, he has Valkyrie, Korg, and then the mighty Thor, Lady Jane. So can he really stand on his own? Oh, man, you really decided to open up the floodgates with that one. So, all right. So with him as the, like on his own, I think like, it it all boils down to like to who's writing him Mm -hmm. because i think like he has a ton of potential like he has a ton of like good stories because chris hemsworth he can uh like he can act and he can do well with what he's given right that's the thing like that's why like even though the thor movies like they aren't the best like he's like again he's given his best it's not like they are horrible they're just more boring or forgettable right like that's kind of not his fault that's just the direction he's going so i feel like he can but it all depends on like what a he has like really good solid uh solo stories um i'm looking at you in the donny cates run uh, <laughs> and and no this is not just a donny cates praise session but uh but that thor run boy you want to give him his rose later <laughs> Look, 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 I, 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 I mean, you're taking words right out of my mouth right now, but, uh, <laughs> but really, like, again, his, like, he has a ton of, like, great stories, great storylines, mm-hmm. and I think, like, again, he could, he could carry a movie, he could, again, but, again, it all boils down to, like, who's directing, and, like, what's the script like, because mm-hmm. if he's given a, if he's given a bad script, or if, well, a good actor can make any bad script mediocre, Fair. but uh, but any any bad director 
can make a good actor seem horrible. Yeah, absolutely. Look at the prequels. <laughs> it's like it's like essentially like good and bad coaching. Yeah. So so to answer your question, yes, yes, he could. Interesting. I like that. So just leaving the make your case section, um, we're gonna get into where does Thor go next? Ah, uh, yes, and and again, we we all kind of like touched on it a bit earlier. So firstly, when it comes to like Valkyrie, she's gonna get her own spinoff series, mm-hmm. and in the comic books, uh, as you know, like Jane Foster ends up becoming a Valkyrie, so that's a perfect way for her to return. Also, as we saw in the movie, like her, like Natalie Portman and Tessa Thompson, they had good chemistry. Right, so yeah. like, like come on now, like sisters. <laughs> it's like there you go. Uh, as for Thor and love, uh, or Thunder and love, uh, I think like, like well, firstly again, war- with Hercules in the picture now, yep, War of the Gods can be coming soon. Uh, Do you uh, kind of want to tease what that is for the people? Essentially, War of the Gods is just like. A giant beef session between <laughs> uh, between Thor and Hercules, like they just butt heads and they just go at it, uh, and pretty much it just drags everybody in with them. So that's pretty much that storyline. But also, I'm and I'm just hoping for this one at this point. Where Beta Ray Bill at? Ooh. Where 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 my horse at? <laughs> Where's the boy? Because y'all y'all missed a huge. Huge opportunity to insert uh, that boy, Beta Ray Bill, in so we can have three Thors fighting Gore, mm-hmm. like in the comics where there were three Thors killing Gore. No, it's not it's a lot of money for actors. Look, <laughs> oh, but they had enough actors to cast all them kids. I'm, I'm, I ain't gonna say nothing. I ain't gonna say nothing. 10,000 each. Look, but uh, but yeah, I think like I, either a war of the gods. Or like a chaos war is coming, which is another comic book event. Though that one leans more towards Hercules than anything else, because mm-hmm. it's like Hercules featuring Thor and everybody else fighting the K- the chaos team, which is a whole can of worms in itself. But that's that is foreshadowing at the Wazoo. Yeah. So right now, Thor and Hercules beefing. What I would love to see, well, we know. <laughs> From the end credit scene, it's going to be Hercules at some point. Does that mean it'll be another Thor movie, or is he going to pop up in something else, or is it potentially a Disney Plus series, or maybe like a like how they're teasing pretty much the Thunderbolts and like yeah. the mini Dark Avengers? Like, mm-hmm. I mean, technically they have a Cap and a Black Widow. Yeah, and now and with Hercules play their cards right, they got a Thor now. Yeah, so who knows? But what I would love to see. This is strictly because of Norse mythology. I have no idea if this is like comic related. I would love for him to face the world snake. Yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Oh, wait, what's the fear itself? That's the comic book event that okay. that, that story is. Uh, and for those who don't know, the fear itself event is where the world serpent pretty much awakens, starts giving like different heroes and villains like their own hammers, which brainwash them but give them like powers similar to that of Thor. It's kind of like Mjolnir but the evil version. Mm-hmm. And pretty much people getting and people were just getting wrecked left and right. You see like Hulk get taken over. You got the thing from the Fantastic Four taken over. Oh. Juggernaut got taken over oh. from the X-Men. Like it, it was it was a bloodbath. And then at the end of it, uh as the prophecy states in all in Norse mythology and all that, Thor does die. So hey if 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 Chris Hemsworth is unable to come back for another one after the fear itself, Thor fear fear itself, like hey, that's a perfect way to go out. Yeah. So like even with that, because like and when like Ragnarok itself, like that's in North mythology is him battling the world snake. Um, it's like it starts with a J. It's like Dramond or something like that. Your Mund. Your All right. Don't get mad at us, Viking friends. So, but essentially, I would love to see that because that's actually his number one villain, not necessarily Loki. Um, so they're more enemies, and that would be really cool just to kind of see a huge snake fighting. Like we even saw a sn- like a snake in the like the omnipotent city, mm-hmm. but I don't. It's way too small to be uh the world serpent. So, mm-hmm. but that would be really cool. So now that we looked at Thor. What is Marvel actually building to? So I feel like right now, Phase 4 is kind of... They're setting stuff up. 
but it's more of a phase five setup. We don't know how certain characters are going to get introduced, even though they're, we know they are going to appear. We don't know who necessarily the main villain is, even though at the same time we kind of do. So what do you think we're going? Well, firstly, phase four is the mental uh, disaster tier. <laughs> I mean, it's mental disaster phase where almost every single character in there faces some type of like mental uh, illness or like danger in what way. We're looking at you, Scarlet Witch, Spider Man, uh, Moon Knight, like <laughs> yeah, and in some in some ways Thor, but uh, but yeah. So like, what is what are Marvel? Where are they building towards right now? That's a great question. Um, I think like again, they're building towards like a multiverse type of deal. So like, uh, maybe Secret Wars. But then again, yeah, it's like it's kind of a thing where they're teasing two things at the same time. Yes, exactly. It's like they're teasing the multiverse slash Secret Wars, but then they're also teasing like the Dark Avengers slash the Thunderbolt, but also King the Conqueror. That's why I say like multiverse mm-hmm. stuff. I right. attribute that with Kang. Like Kang and pretty much being like the main bad guy of the multiverse, and then you got Dark Avengers for the Dark Avengers side. So it's like they're playing like 5D chess right now. They're trying to do like multiple things, and I think it might be it might be good to like just just focus on one of them right now. Mm-hmm. Uh, because uh, as of right now, it's like we have no idea what y'all doing anymore. Yeah, and even with uh, building to Secret Wars, I don't necessarily think that'll introduce the Beyonder. Which would be cool to see, but I just don't expect it. Uh, um, but even with like phase one, we kind of we knew that we were building to an Avengers movie ever since Iron Man movie. Mm-hmm. And then once we saw the first Avengers movie, we knew we were building to the Infinity Saga. From here, it's kind of like Black Widow had a weird release kind of situation. Yeah, because uh, it wasn't necessarily supposed to be after uh, she died. Yeah. Um, then just like No Way Home, which is. A classic it it made sense where it was at um just even with dr strange's multiverse of madness that felt like more of a setup movie and then even with thor i liked it as like its own thing just not sure where to go next and then i'm not sure what the next movie is is it black panther 2 yes yeah, so it is black panther uh wakanda forever yeah and just it'll be interesting to see how they treat that movie because a part of it um, knowing that Chadwick passed away, unfortunately, I feel like part of that movie is going to be, okay, we got to set up, how do we get the new Black Panther, but at the same time, it's going to be an appreciation movie for him. So that's going to be kind of like serving multiple dimensions. So. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And yeah, so pretty much at the end of the day, it's like, uh, I say like, let's just, we just got to keep waiting and see. Yeah. Especially like, uh, as we've seen like more series come out, like, with Moon Knight and just like pretty much the God Pantheon to deal, you got uh, Miss Marvel, which uh, I believe the last episode is coming out next, next week. Yep. Yeah, actually, when this episode releases, that'll be the last episode. And then we have She Hulk coming soon. Yes. And we'll see how that one goes. And we can't get another Hulk movie, but <laughs> I'll leave it alone. You know? <laughs> well, 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 we, I'm not going to get into that right now, but. uh. Dang, I've been teasing World War Hulk. I've, I've heard rumors about that. Um, if they are teasing World War Hulk, then, uh, man, y'all have been doing a crackpot job of doing that. <laughs> as, uh, because that's supposed to follow Planet Hulk and and Planet Hulk, and and like he's supposed to be an absolute monster, but uh, but nah, we got a, a good old Professor Hulk. So uh, this is far from that. And if, I swear, if 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 they're teasing to Immortal Hulk, well, listen, Disney, if y'all te- if y'all do Immortal Hulk, I will take back every wrongdoing I've ever said. I don't care how y'all do it. If y'all get a multi- Mortal Hulk and the Devil Hulk in there, I, I will give y'all my children. <laughs> <laughs> but it's funny if you think about it speaking about hulk hulk got beat so bad by thanos that he had he learned language and then he also had to wear glasses now <laughs> no. i'm not i'm not even, i'm not even getting into that <laughs> but just go from there i think we definitely just kind of need to wait but it is exciting in terms of just news with echo um we're going to get daredevil and also kingpin back I don't know how they're going to do Kingpin, but I think, yeah, just wait. Just strap in and trust Kevin Feige because he definitely has a vision. Mm-hmm. And 
So we'll just go from where it goes. Yep. Trust the Don. Yep. And now, now that we've done that, we are going to get into our next sponsor break. Are you into his guardian architecture? Are you into his guardian artifacts such as Mjolnir and Stormbreaker? Well, come join the Asgardian High Council, where you're able to oversee the entire Asgardian Museum. And be sure that as an Asgardian High Council, you are not granted the rank of master. Please, come join the High Council now. Okay, so for that last one, it wasn't our deep dive yet. We were kind of just chilling out on a yacht, um, discussing Marvel, chopping it up. But we also rented a submarine. And this is about to get super deep. Um, so we're going to discuss the true power of love and go from there. So strap in, get ready for the deep pressure. It's time for the deep dive. So going from there, we just have... The true power of love. So starting light, how do you feel about the romance between Thor and Jane? All right. So the romance between Thor and Jane, I feel like it's it's kind of real-ish because, like, like of course, the first thing Jane notices, because I'm going all the way back to Thor 1. Right. It's like, first thing he notices is his appearance, right? And, of course, she knows, like, his brutish attitude and whatnot and just... Just how everything goes with him, and it's kind of like the scenario of the good girl changing the bad boy uh-huh. into someone better, which literally was the point of Thor one. Uh, and Thor, like, of course, he was pretty much physically attracted to her, and just building up the romance there. And it's like, hey, they're they're pretty much a couple. Like, of course, they do stuff together. Of course, you know, like Thor leaves comes back during Avengers, and the first thing that happens is that she slaps him in the face in Thor 2. And I was like, yeah. Yeah, that's real. It's like, you don't contact me for a while? And, but yeah, see, like, their romance just continue to blossom and and uh, get, and pretty much grow. And then you see in Thor Ragnarok that, uh, because Natalie Portman decided not to come back for that one, uh, mm-hmm. she got written out. It's like, hey, they broke up with the Dear John Larry. I'm just like, mmm. That was tough. Mm, that was rough because uh, I mean, D- the Dear John letter. That, if case for anybody who don't know, that's where pretty much they just write a letter to you, basically stating that y'all broke up, and then they just leave. Mm-hmm. So most of the time, they write the letter, leave it somewhere where you can find it, and they're already gone with all their stuff. And that's probably like one of the, in my opinion, a really terrible way to do it because uh, it's like you like you the lack of closure there. Right, but. But man, did this movie Love and Thunder really touch on the love and it touched on like a real thing of just like seeing your ex after, in the case of Thor, like eight years. Right. And after he pretty much lost everything, he, he thought like pretty much, hey, I I have nothing. I'm I'm pretty much like cold stone. And and then in comes Jane, and it's like, oh, you see like some of the sparks rekindling. And you see them like get back together, yeah. For as brief as that is, uh, but I really do like that type of romance because it just it was just like, yeah, yeah, that's kind of how it would go, kind of. Yeah. I think I I enjoyed it. I think it was well written. I think the tough part of her like not being in certain movies, um, and that's her choice. Obviously, I'm not knocking her for that. But like, I think when you have to do a montage of a romance, it's kind of tough. But it didn't have, for me, it didn't have the connection of a Tony Stark and a Pepper Potts. Yes. Because Pepper is, like, in literally every movie and, like, has a bigger, at least a big enough role where it's, like, oh, you can kind of feel their connection with that. But it was, like, man, just, like, kind of just, like, seeing how, like, that one scene where they're walking in the omnipotent city and it's just, like, that awkwardness of just, like, hey, how are you? Oh, did you find anyone? And then as soon as, like, she asks that, she just, like, dips off. Yeah. And that's just, real. that's that's really real um, from that perspective. And so I think it was that star-crossed effect of them was really just tough to kind of watch. And then, like, they finally found, like, a big theme was, like, choose love. Mm-hmm. And they finally found it. And they were accepting of their feelings. But then at the same time, it was just, like, it couldn't be, which is rough. 
Yeah, it's kind of like your. It was similar to a Romeo and Juliet type situation. It's like, hey, y'all want to be together, but uh, but fate would have it that uh, it 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 just can't. And like sometimes that's just how life is. Like sometimes you can't be with the person that that you feel like you're in love with for various reasons. Uh, either either there's like some not there or or just any type of other deal. It's like people face that all the time. Yeah, I appreciate, too, that they didn't wait till the very end of the movie for them to kind of reconcile. Like they had that scene on the boat where it's like she where he's like uh, taking Star Wars advice. And he's like, I missed you so much. I want you to be my what I feel bad about, like something that I have that I can cherish and be precious. And she's like, oh, I have cancer. And like you just feel that moment where it's like, boom, like the theater went completely silent Mm -hmm. at that line because it's just like, man, like because people know what that feels like. Um. And it's not even like pure romance talking about, uh, but then being able to love and just like, hey, let's spend these precious moments together. And then when she they get back and he finds out that what Mjolnir is doing to her, he's like, hey, I just stay here. If we have a chance at more, just stay, please. And then she's like, no, I'm going to protect you. I can spend my moment, my final moments with you being the mighty Thor, but also being with you, which was just really touching. Oh, yeah. That hospital scene was it was truly gut wrenching, but again, a hundred percent real because exactly. I know like a lot of people who pre- and we're gonna talk more about the grieving process, but like I like Thor basically went through kind of like the bargaining stage at that point. He was right. like, "Look, look, please, just it was kind of like for me and for you, so that way like we can have as long of a life as as possible." Right? Please, just. Please, I don't know what to do if I saw you die like this early. Just just stay. And Thor can live for thousands of years, which is the crazy part. So like those few moments are nothing to his lifespan. Mm-hmm. But he, again, like as you said, like he lived thousands of lives, probably had like multiple had multiple lovers, which they did in the montage at the beginning. Mm-hmm. But like she was the only one that A connected with him on a more personal level. And brought the humanity out of them. So, like, that's pretty special. Like, you never... It was kind of like a... Kind of like a joke back to... And, like, when they were walking through a nip in the city, it was like, you never forget your first bad guy. I was like, or do, do you mean you never forget your first love? Mm. Mm. Crazy. I, yeah. I see what you did there. <laughs> yeah, so going from there, how do you feel about just superhero movies and how they handle romance in general? Oh, man. Well, I think, like, for... How they handle it, it it depends because there are some great movies like as you mentioned with the uh, Iron Man, like Tony and Pepper Potts, like their romance is pretty great because like it was also part of Tony's development from a narcissist to a pretty much a better person mm-hmm. at the very end of it. And I can see like many times where like the romances are like okay, there are some great romances there. I can see like. Like T'Challa be like T'Challa and uh, Nakia, mm-hmm. like their romance is like it was kind of similar to uh, similar to Thor, except like okay, they they're not together anymore, but like the feelings were still there, but it wasn't like they broke up uh, because of something terrible or right. anything like that. And plus, like they still had a future together, but uh, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, so I think like there's that. There's also like the Steve and Peggy romance. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful ones. Like that one that one's even more of a star cross lover than anything yeah. else. Cause, yeah. Cause 70 years or 70 plus years of just not seeing each other. Yeah. That new game scene was definitely touching. Mm-hmm. And just seeing that, we we can never forget MJ and Peter. Like, In every variation. <laughs> Mm, most variations i was like the the sam raimi version i'm like uh I... spider-man 2 i i thought it was really good yeah well it was good and then three kind of kind of tarnished it by yeah. a lot but but no way home kind of fixed it mm-hmm. at the very end so so that was good there i mean and of course like before you know what happened the love between andrew and and gwen was yeah was spot on but yeah. there are a lot of movies where just like seeing like again just superhero movies where just the romance kind of doesn't land mm-hmm. uh, i can think of a few like 
Ghost Rider, that one didn't land for me at all. Uh, and, and most of the time, it's kind of like a deal where the romance just seems like, oh, like, we're just, like, physically attracted to each other, and that's about it. Yeah. It's like, I can deal with your, like, super heroics and deal with all your shenanigans, like, like I can do all that later, or, like, you don't even think about that part, mm-hmm. or some people get together because they're a superhero. Right. I was like, mm, mm, that, that kind of, that's kind of out there, but, uh, that, that kind of doesn't work for me. Um, but, but like one that did work was like, we're looking at the X-Men movies. Well, specifically, a, it's actually more of a love triangle than anything else <laughs> between Scott, Gene, and, and Logan. Ooh, that was rough. Oh boy. Yeah. The, the roughness of that one, that one was a whole tragedy. Uh, for Scott. <laughs> Poor Scott and poor, poor Logan. What you mean? <laughs> like Logan was the one who got it the worst. I mean, he didn't get eviscerated. Adam, like we talked about. But again, he had to kill her. I, I'd probably rather get atomized by a person I love than me kill. Well, actually, nah, nah I'd rather live. Yeah, the truth comes out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I was like, I, I thought about that for like the, for half a millisecond. I was like. Nah, there's more fish out there. I, I, I'll live. <laughs> I choose life. But uh, I can imagine just the, the emotional toll of that. Now, be, yeah. now, this is a romance that is probably going to get me in trouble, Mm-mm. but I really did not like Hulk and Black Widow. Yes. I did not think that worked. Like They teased like three or four romances with Black Widow. I don't think they knew what they wanted to do with her for a while. At, with that character until like the Infinity War and Endgame. Mm-hmm. But yeah, that that one did not work for me personally because like a Bruce. Firstly, you had Betty, Betty Burr. But well, but we don't even know if the first Hulk movie is canon ten- because it's a completely different person. Yeah, but technically it is because you get William Hurt. Yeah, but yeah. then we never see Betty again. No, but uh, no, but uh, still. Still, it's like, but it was that, that was again. That was the, that's kind of like the key deal. It's like you never see her again, even though they had a straight love for each other, like in in that Incredible Hulk movie. But he never mentions her. He never like goes out to look for her. And Thunderbolt Ross, that's literally his daughter. He never mentions her. Thank you. I'm just like, sir. It's like, what are y'all doing? It's like that's number one. Number two, uh. And two, again, like with Hulk and like the whole deal with the romance is the fact like typically he wants to like be compatible with somebody who like can handle like not only himself, but also the stress of Hulk life, right. which is what Betty has to T. Like Black Widow, she more than likely, it seemed like she was more fascinated with Bruce than Hulk. After the Avengers scene, which was a straight up horror movie, mm-hmm. not going to cap, but uh. But yeah, I, that was just one that just did not stick it for me. Yeah, I, I think from, well, like now that you mentioned Betty, like Betty is literally like the MJ of the Hulk uh, universe. And oh man, we, we you can tell listeners that we really love the Hulk and we just want better for our boy. But mm-hmm. I think this with like romance in general, it can, it's usually second-handed. And like, like how we talked about uh, before with like comics that are written and Mostly the 60s, 70s. Yep. So that's like prime male, you know, yep. I, well, I eat nails for breakfast without any milk kind of situation. <laughs> um, but just like with that where it's like, okay, so now I'm the guy, macho, I save the girl, I get the girl. It's kind of like that. Simple, straightforward. So that kind of carries over into movies and kind of, I really love what you said about, I'm the main uh, character as a guy. This is the main character as a girl. We both look very attractive because, you know, that's how we got hired and cast. Let's get together. And there's no chemistry beyond that. It's like, oh, I saved you one time. And then like, okay, now we're together. Mm -hmm. Um, So it can be very secondary. But again, like if it's interwoven and it's treated like real life, then it's real. And just like you can avoid the fridging situation where I think a lot of the times where it's like, okay, movie one, we set up the love interest. Movie two, now we fridge her. Look in that Deadpool. They literally did that. Mm -hmm. Um, and then they and reversed Spider-Man. it, but still, yes, Spider-Man. every every Spider-Man movie did that. Um, but it's like you're serving two masters at the time. Yeah. And it de- and it obviously it depends on what you're looking for. Some people are just looking for straight action. 
some people you're trying to get a new audience so you try to get the romance from it but just from there it it depends again like writing directing yep yep absolutely and and now like let's talk into an aspect of uh of romance which is jealousy yeah like you see it in thor love love and thunder when it comes to a love triangle between Thor, Milner, and Stormbreaker. Yes. How do, how do you think like uh, that is addressed and like how real that was? In the movie, obviously it's played for laughs. It's like, oh, haha, ha, his weapons are coming together. But I've always said this about jealousy. It's cute the first time, and it gets progressively less cute each time until it becomes troublesome. Because obviously there's that desire in us to want to be desired for mm-hmm. someone to go, oh, this is mine. No one else can have them. That first time it's cute. But um, speaking from slight experience, after a while, it it becomes sort of dangerous um, mm-hmm. depending on the person. Mm-hmm. And then also it's just like annoying. You can't, the thing about jealousy, why it's like one of the reasons it's so bad. If you cannot trust me, why are we together? Mm-hmm. Like that's just like as simple as it can be. And then it shows a, it can show a deeper insecurity. And then like in the movie, we saw Stormbreaker start starts acting up. It's not, you know, doing well with that. And we can see just like, OK, a broken trust. And after a while, it's a red flag. So I think jealousy, like in real life relationships, whether that's like romantic or not, is it's a red flag to a point. Yeah, a hundred percent. Like when it comes to that it's, and like jealousy and just love triangles in general, I think like. A whole aspect of it is just like it it doesn't look good for you no like it does it does not at all like in no context in my opinion because uh it's like oh it's like you're wanting something more even though it more than likely can't have it and progressively and if you keep focusing on it and you keep focusing on it and you look at like and how like media is portrayed nowadays some of that jealousy t- leans more towards the villains mm-hmm. than it is the heroes. And uh, sp- and speaking from very, very slight personal experience, I can tell you that, uh, that yeah, again, not a good look. And typically most people do not side with you when you're the jealous one. Right. It's not cute, boo-boo. Nope, nope, it ain't for you. And when it comes to like, the portrayals of that in movies... I- Especially in superheroes, again, we we see the love triangle between Scott Jean and Wolverine. Uh, it's like the jealousy kind of leans more on the Wolverine. Well, actually, no, it's actually equal between yeah. Scott and Wolverine because so. Scott's always stand offish, especially towards Logan, and mm-hmm. then Logan just returns that in kind. Uh, and oh, oh, the biggest one, Spider Man Three. Yes, I was thinking of that. Yeah, like the jealousy in that one between Peter, Gwen, Harry, and MJ, that love square. It like brought down the movie significantly. And then if you count it, technically Eddie brought to <laughs> like I uh, like I don't because like bruh, you you is like such a back note. Uh, again, you're a disgrace to the name Eddie Brock. Mm-hmm. Uh but like that love that love square, it was like kind of one of the worst things in the movie because yeah. peter looked horrible uh, especially after that bar scene especially under the control of symbiote he was out here wilding uh harry almost wanted to kill peter because yeah. of the love he had for mj like he straight up broke the bro code in spider-man one yeah. when it was like bro you didn't have a chance to go speak with her so i just swoped him like bro you broke the cut bro code you is out of here and, it's, and it all comes to head in Spider-Man 3. And then you get a pumpkin bomb to the face. Yes, but, I mean, also his... Th- he thought he killed his dad. I mean, I mean that's... <laughs> no, that's... A, uh, we ain't talking about that. We're talking about love squares. Semantics. Right? <laughs> weird. We're getting into the weeds right now, but... And then MJ, of course, being especially jealous of when Peter quits kiss Gwen. I was yeah. like... I mean, that one kind of leaned more towards... That one's more understandable because of the fact that, like... The iconic kiss, too. Yeah, I was like... Cause Peter, what is you doing? Like that one, that one's understandable, but but still, people give her flack. But it's like at the end of the day, like with that one's like jealousy. Again, not a great look. Uh, so your personal experience, like just just don't. It's like it's not gonna end out well for you. And if you do, it's like get 
you may need to talk with somebody. Yeah. And speaking of talking with someone, going from there, we, we really get into our deep dive, but dealing with heart grief and heartbreak. Man. All right. So dealing with grief and heartbreak, that one's, that one's really big for me because, like, I talk about that one a lot, like, outside of the podcast. I, that's, like, one of the things I'm big, I'm really big on, especially because they're, like, I went through it. Mm-hmm. And touching on that, it's, like, there are right ways of going through it because and go and wrong ways of going about it. Right. Like, people, of course, we're all different. And we have, like, our own ways of grieving. Like, no two people, more, for the most part, will grieve the same way or deal with heartbreak the same way. But as I said, like there, but there are also right ways and wrong ways of dealing with it. An example of like a wrong way is like stewing in those like negative emotions and like not move and not moving forward or progressing, just staying in there for so long that it pretty much consumes your daily life. Or people try to like drown it out with things, you know, like with substances, you know, like drugs and alcohol, like right. that's, that's probably like one of the biggest, biggest what negative ways of dealing with is just throwing it down in a bottle and whatnot. And that's also ways where jealousy can come in and just different things like that. It's just, it's just, it's heartbreaking to see it like that. Yeah, I definitely, what you mentioned, just like negative ways. I even was listening to just like these reactors and they were talking about the emotional scar tissue that people have. Uh, when we talk about the boys and we can get into butcher later, but just like how we, when we've been through something, you can just like respond in such a negative way. And it's like, okay, why are you acting like this? It's, it doesn't make any sense, but it's like, this is the way that I do it in order to not just protect people, but also protect myself. Um, and I know just like, dealing with uh, negative ways that you mentioned, uh, being like real about it. Uh, I went through like the situation where I was like going through a lot. And just to give like background context, I don't really drink a lot. Um, like ever since I turned over 21, like years ago, like I've probably drunk less than 10 times. Like, I just don't like, people think it's a moral reason. I just don't like the taste of alcohol. <laughs> like it just tastes disgusting to me. And if I have to make a face when I'm drinking something, I rather not do it. Um, but I just like was going through the situation of like a, a real tough heartbreak. And I remember just like the first thing I went to, I was like, okay, let me get some alcohol. And it's so funny because I don't know what I was buying. <laughs> uh, so like I got this glass, or this uh, bottle or whatever. And like the, the crazy thing is like I never got drunk like when I finished it over the weekend. But the thing is that the, the alcohol content was so low <laughs> that it was like literally drinking water. <laughs> but the, the point of that, me saying that is that it's what that's what I went to um because I wanted to numb it um that's kind of like my even just like without substance it's like mental I want to numb it I'm an emotional number like don't feel it don't talk about it like let's set all the level emotional levels to like the bare minimum um and that's like a really just like negative way that I kind of just like deal with that and we see it with Thor where mm-hmm. like he becomes fat Thor and like it's like oh jokey jokey in Endgame but it's like that's like even Cork says it in the new one where it's like this is him trying to protect himself. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And also like another way again, negative ways like lashing out or being angry. Mm-hmm. That was kind of like my way when I went through similar things. Like I mean, I I like I'm I'm like yeah, like I'm slightly more of a drinker, but like I'm more of a social thing. It's like it's like yeah, the taste I can take it or leave it. But uh but for me it was like it was mostly like internal. Mm-hmm. It's like it's like <clears throat> because I tend to be like the type where I bottle everything in. Same. But unfortunately when you do, it tends to blow over and and like suddenly like what seems to be the smallest thing, I'll just snap at somebody for no reason whatsoever. And and like or sometimes, like, for me, whenever, like, I'm in, like, those high-pressure or high-stress emotions, like, like I may have to, like, like physically do something. And, like, and like that's kind of kind of lean more towards, like, positive way, like, just an outlet of, like, how do you get through it? Mm-hmm. Especially, like, if you're knee-deep in the negative ways, though, we can discuss that in a little bit. Just the topic of fighting for or letting someone go yeah so so in this so in the thor movie right we see like 
as we mentioned earlier, like Thor is fighting to like keep Jane alive, especially at that hospital scene. But then at the end of the movie, when she makes the choice to come anyways, and like, and like he, and there's nothing he could have done. It's like, and he has to accept it. It's like, it's like, that was powerful, man. What yes. you think? I, it was, it was hard because he was like, yo, I want those precious moments with you. And a lot of people deal with that, like where that's a real situation where someone is sick and they like, I don't want to be a burden to you. And I feel so much pain every day I wake up and I just wanted to end. And then at the same time, it can feel like, oh, I just want these moments with you, even if like that's, and then you have to wrestle with, is that selfish of me? Mm -hmm. um, so I think fighting for someone is so tough because I think you have to respect them and their wishes, like first and foremost, uh, at the same time, like, because here's where with the jealousy and other stuff, it can be possessive where it's like, you're putting your needs above them. And mm -hmm. sometimes whether it's uh, in a situation of just like familial or non-romantic platonic relationships, it can be like, oh, I'm trying to prioritize this over myself. And then in terms of romance, it can be like, you may think that you are a prince and someone's a princess or however you want to phrase that, but maybe they need to become a queen on their own. And that's not for you to get them to that level. So I think that was just seeing that was powerful in the movie. Yeah, definitely, definitely. And with that, like, that leads more towards, like, the positive ways of dealing with grief. Like, as you mentioned, like, uh, like, as I mentioned earlier, like, outlets is just like, all right, so I know some people tend to, like, do this and it's became kind of a meme. But, like, for me, it's like, oh, doing, uh, like, doing exercising or, like, doing some type of, like, physical activity, mm -hmm. but stuff that is productive rather than just doing it randomly or, like, doing something that won't amount to anything right uh, and again there's like plenty of other ways of like positive like grief and positive like dealing with things um do you have like anything in mind yeah that? for me i think even when i was talking about that just that situation that i was going through what really turned the tide for me is that i was just on a drive and i was coming back and i was listening to one of my favorite podcasts and i laughed and it was like at that moment i realized you're going to be okay like, you can laugh, you can smile, you can feel, you're going to be okay. And just, that was so powerful to me because I think I could have spiraled further if I didn't have that moment, or at least I would have just kept pushing it and suppressing it more. So that really just helped. And even this goes into the key and importance of self-love. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Because, like, I because this goes back to, like, a really great statement of, like, if you can't like love yourself then nobody else would right and like because it all starts with because you know like dealing with grief and heartbreak uh it it starts with it starts with like you internally and it reminds me of the quote in wandavision where it's like grief is the last thing that you give to the like to the deceased or to the to the uh party that you're leaving mm -hmm. because it shows you that like those emotions are real right like those like it's like you would not grieve over somebody you didn't care about mm -hmm. so so like and the key in parents and, and like the main importance is like realizing that like hey these are real like these like these happen like let's cherish these moments right let's go and like let's like let's make the best out of it and and like that's like the beginning of the of the self-love journey mm -hmm. of like a realizing like when you're going down a spiral and actively actively doing what you can or getting help as needed yeah so this movie didn't touch too much on self-love it was more of just love in general um romantic and platonic but i just really appreciate yeah it is important to love yourself. Um, and even I remember this stand-up comedy with Cat Williams. Yeah, I think it was I was in middle school, but he talked about your star player and he was referring to <laughs> So yeah, you know what I'm talking about. So he's talking about about yourself. Like you look in the mirror and like the person looking back at you is your star player and you have to hype them up. And this goes to really think about how you talk about yourself. Um, 
I know like sometimes for me, like I can kind of be jokey jokey where it's like I tell a joke or something and I'm like, bro, I hate you so much for saying that joke. And it's like familial, but like there are times where people are literally like, yo, you useless, worthless piece of crap. And that's how they talk about themselves. Like they wouldn't talk about anybody else like that, but they, that's how you talk about yourself. That was me. And that is like, it's tough to like really um, put yourself down like that um and this kind of goes with like self-confidence and self-esteem where i feel like self-confidence if you don't have it it holds you back but lack of self-esteem holds you down um and not progressing so just like even with the key and importance of self-love if you can't compliment yourself or you can't find something that like is good for you then that's really hard when it translates to accepting love from others and then also just like being able to love others yeah 100 percent. and like again love what you're saying like at the end of the day like when it like if you start practicing self-love for yourself naturally you're gonna start seeing like boosts in your self-confidence and your self-esteem and eventually like just overall like studies have been shown to where like you self-loving like you taking care of yourself leads to a longer and a much more like uh like a much more satisfactory or a life or a long life to live. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with that, it's okay to be selfish to an extent. Yep. Um, it's okay to be like, Hey, I want to do this thing for myself and that's fine. Um, just, yeah, really appreciating yourself. Really just like being able to be, look in the mirror and be like, yo, you are validate yourself. That's kind of just what I'm going to validate yourself to be like, Hey, you're beautiful. Hey, you're smart. Like there's something that we're all good at or capable of in some sense. So that's really key and important. Yeah. Yeah. And now and just thank you for that. And now team, we can finally take off that scuba gear. I'm sure everybody here is probably like crying to a bit. Um, yeah. So grab your tissues as well, but but now it's time for the return of a special segment called Come Get Your Rose. Yep. So now that we're going to have 30 and 40 year old women in our DMs talking about they can save our lives, <laughs> we're going to keep moving on. But for the Come Get Your Rose, I'm giving it to Taika Watiti for saving Thor. Again, we just talked about like the first two. It was very, very serious um kind of just like grunge to an extent and just like he brought life to thor uh we we see thor in like the other avenger movies he has more of a personality but just for his own solo films both in ragnarok and thor love and thunder Mm -hmm. you just really felt that personality i felt like we actually connected with thor more in these two movies and just going from there so he really just like saved the character and the mythos and if there is another individual standalone thor movie i'm here for it yep so so moving from there we're getting into our mailbag q a so you can hit us up at blurredcity22 at gmail.com or if you want to uh even hit us up dm us on twitter or instagram blurredcity22 or hit the discord so yeah yeah, and so this is like one of those times where you have just a ton of questions that are being sent out, and we can definitely, and we're definitely gonna go in and answer them. We have so many uh, submissions as well, so def- we're also our hopefully our bonus episode is a Q and A. So just keep sending them. Yep, just keep going, and we'll answer them on there. So our first question today is Stormbreaker or Milnir? <sighs> okay, for me. I was thinking about this. I see the Mjolnir is the OG and the thing with Stormbreaker, it's an axe and it's very long. So like it's kind of tough for close battle, um, close range battle. But the problem with an axe, if it gets stuck in something, you're in trouble. I've seen too many uh, zombie movies and TV shows where they do an axe to the skull and they can't pull it out. But so I'm going to roll with Mjolnir. Mm. Even though I love an axe. Uh, for me, I just, I gotta go with Milnir as well. Uh, I think, like, for me, firstly, it's more iconic of a weapon. Uh, and and secondly, like, hey, anybody who is worthy is able to wield it. And, and it proves, like, your test of character. Mm-hmm. So, like, hey, if you can't lift it, then uh, what does that say about you? Yep. And that's why, like, I... I pretty much personally love them. And plus it's a hammer. Hammer is super 
utilitarian. It's like, you can use that for anything in your daily life. Hammer time. And, yep, but an axe, um, it's only useful for one thing, and that's cutting something. Yeah. But yeah, so, so thank you for that submission. Our next question is, are there any Marvel villains that you kind of agree with? And if so, what makes you agree with them? Uh, the tough part is a lot of Marvel villains, their premise is understandable, but their answer is always genocide. And when your answer to a question is genocide, I can't rock with you. So Killmonger and yeah, Killmonger, I kind of I was like, OK, yes, you even see like he's like, OK, there are people around the world that look like us and we have this utopia and we sit here, we do nothing and you hide behind everything. And then you even see at the end of the movie where um, the Black Panther is like, hey, we need to expand Wakanda. We need to show them what we really are. But it was kind of just like at the same time, it was still genocide. But I think for me, Adrian Toomes, um, a.k.a. the Vulture, where it's like we see in the beginning of the show where movie of Homecoming and he's cleaning up uh, the records of New York with all the people and his entire crew gets fired and like the government comes in, they take in all the material. And just from that perspective, it's like, OK, if you can take this per, um, material, I why can't we? You know, it's not fair from that perspective. And then I can also kind of agree with Ghost from Ant-Man 2, where she just kind of wanted her body back. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And for me, I pretty much like, like, I'm pretty much divorcing, like, what they do or, like, what their answer is from their motivation. (laughs) Which, if that's the case, I'm 100% Killmonger. For for pretty much the same reasons. Like, he, he a brother... And like he pretty much just wanted to help all the brothers around the brothers and sisters around the world. Um, how he does it is completely uh completely insane. But hey, that that is what it is. Uh, but if if you don't want me to go with that cop out, all right, <laughs> and combine motivation with their uh motive, I would probably have to go with. Oh no! Hey, I can't do a Carly Morgenthau from uh, Captain America: The Winter Soldier because she commits so many heinous atrocities. Even though she was all like, she pretty much had the right mindset. She had the right everything, and she would have came to the light. But then a certain a certain U.S. agent decided to come in and mess all that up. But mm. but that's neither here nor there. Oh man! Other than that, like really, there's not really. Much and by the way, like villains, you actually agree with. I'll probably say Ghost as well. It's like she's mm-hmm. like again, she's just trying to she's trying to get back to her actual body. Which like, I mean, if you were in that situation, do the same thing. Yeah, I can also kind of rock with Baron Zemo, except mm. uh, I understand it because I've watched The Boys. So it's like seeing people get superpowers. Like I can understand that per- it's better explained in Captain America and the Winter Soldier. Well, the Falcon and the Winter Soldier, quote unquote, but, uh, <laughs> but it's better explained there. But yeah, it, once it leads to that, I can't rock with you. All right. For our final question in the MCU, when Thanos did the finger snap, half of the population disappeared. Do you think it was truly random or do you think it there was a pattern or reason to the people who were blipped? OK, so this was a question I had to think about a lot when it was submitted. I was just like dang, it's, was it truly random or was it not so? And in my opinion, I think it actually was. All right, and here's my line of thought. Okay, so when it comes to like, okay, so when it comes to like the Avengers and all the superheroes who were snapped away, it's like, okay, they were the right people who needed to go out and, and like take care of things. But at the same time, like Ant-Man was kind of the key there. <laughs> If he was gone, like, if he got snapped rather than anybody else, well, him, Wasp, and Hank Pym, like, if those three, like, either all three of them get dusted, then there would have been no endgame, right? Mm -hmm. However, if it was, like, if even one of them was alive, then the rest of endgame could have still happened. So here's the thing. And also, when it comes to, like, Okay, all the random people out there who got blipped and then came back, right? 
like you think about all the people who probably like were just going about their daily lives like if between you and me mm-hmm. for example who got got snapped i was like if i ended up going versus like if you would have went right uh it's like at the end of the day like that had no bearing on everything so i think like in terms of like who all got snapped i think like if the other half of the avengers got snapped well actually tony was actually another key there as well Mm -hmm. so if he got taken out then that would have been game over too right so i chalked that one up to the timeline to the sacred timeline yeah i think out of universe reasons they kept the og avengers just to kind of like wrap up their story in endgame in the universe I think it was, I do think it was random because if it wasn't random, um, one way I would have been able to, we would have been able to tell is that if like Thanos' uh, guard was uh, blipped up or not, but all of them died. So we couldn't tell from that, but you know, obviously Thanos existed, but it kind of, yeah. it's hard to tell if that's random, but I do think it was random. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. But but yeah, thank you all for submitting those questions. And just keep them coming. Yeah, we're going to answer them later. Uh, we might have more mailbag sections. And then also we might give you a bonus episode towards the end of our season of Q&A. So thanks for all of the senders. Get into our recommendations. All righty, guys. So for our recommendations for today, we have, of course, all of the MCU, but specifically Thor, Thor the Dark World, and Thor Ragnarok, which are all found on Disney+. Plus. Uh, and if you want to see Thor Love and Thunder, it's currently in theaters and it will be on Disney Plus at some determinate point in time. So be uh, be looking out for that. Also, again, as I mentioned earlier in the video, look at Legends of Dragon Ball Tale by Agent Mystery Meat. It's an amazing uh, animation on Dragon Ball and it's a huge love letter to the series. So definitely take a look out for that. Uh, if you haven't watched The Boys, go ahead and watch that on uh, watch that on Amazon Prime, and of course Miss Marvel, which has her last episode coming out on Disney Plus when this episode releases. So yeah, that's pretty much my main recommendations. All right, my recommendations we have Vikings, the TV show, mm-hmm. one of the greatest shows that ever occurred with Vikings in general. Um, I believe it. part of it is on Netflix. I know they had a continuation series. Uh, also, Vinland Saga, that's on Netflix as well, yes, that sir. we mentioned in our anime episode. And then finally, The Northman. I believe it's just getting out of theaters. I'm not sure where you can find it, but it's a really classic, just like uh, Norse kind of Scandinavian tale from there. But coming up, uh, we had a really great episode. Um, a lot talking one of our deepest episodes yet mm-hmm. but um just for what to look forward to next week we are going to talk about the boys uh the next following week we're going to get into our nope movie review and from there we're just going to kind of see what happens towards the end of the month but we have a lot of exciting things going on so just go ahead like subscribe share rate the show uh five stars five stars five stars and yeah so Mitch do you want to hit us with the plugs oh yes so of course we have our Instagram and Twitter which is at blurred city 22 b-l-e-r-g-c-i-t-y 22 and on our Instagram page we have our discord which is a great community for sharing and for sharing content sharing memes talking with us and talking with each other and that can be found in the Instagram and we have our YouTube, which is Blurred City Pod, as well as our Patreon, which is also Blurred City Pod, where you can support us and have access to very exclusive episodes, like a review of Trapped in a Dating Simulator, character analysis of Gara, and other different content like that. So please subscribe there. We have our email, which is BlurredCity22 at gmail.com. Which there, along with our Discord, is where you can submit questions to us uh, for the mailbag Q&A. Or you can submit your random fan theory or even a come get your rose as well. Right. And for my individual author pages, we have our my Instagram, Mitri underscore Das. So M-E-T-R-I underscore D-A-S-H. Twitter, at the Mad Dash 16. And if you're interested in buying my book, it's available on Amazon, Phantom Pains, and Most Irregular Tell. So, as usual, we're going to leave you with some words of encouragement. And yes, so my words of encouragement for you today is that grief 
is a natural part of life. You will experience it. Everyone will experience it at least one time. Um, it is completely okay and it's completely all right to have those feelings, but please try your best to not let it control your life. Yeah. For me, I'm going to say make the decision to choose love. Um, Self-love, particularly in this case. If you want to go see that movie by yourself, it's completely fine. If you want to go to a restaurant by yourself, completely fine. Pig out, splurge, just make the decision to love yourself. You are worthy and deserving of love, um, regardless of if anyone else tells you that. So just make the choice to love yourself. And as usual, we're going to say... It's not goodbye forever, it's just goodbye for now. And that's the Blurred City Pod. We'll see you later. Uh, do you want to get some ice cream and watch Crazy Stupid Love after this? Uh, of course I do, bruh.